The last speaker in uh, this session is Dr. Sveta Zarpostic. He's associate professor from uh, Vilnius University. Uh, research interests are comparative literature, literature theory, cultural studies, and intercultural communication. And uh, Dr. Postich had the blessing to spend the time with Elder Tadeusz of Vitomnica in the 90s, and he follows uh, his spiritual advice up to so far. Please, Dr. Postich. I'm very grateful to you for inviting me here and to God for bringing me here. Okay. In the autumn of 1990, when I was 20 years old, I had the blessing to meet and talk to Archimandrite uh, Thaddeus of Vitovnica, a famous Serbian elder. My road to Vitovnica, a monastery on the edge of a small village by the same name in eastern Serbia, started in Kragujevac. When my twin brother and I told the bishop there we were thinking about becoming monastics, he sent us to spend the night at a nearby monastery. There we met a young hieromonk, Father Philemon, who told us about Father Thaddeus, his spiritual father, and suggested we go there to seek his advice. We had heard about Elder Thaddeus just a few days earlier from a friend whose mother went to talk to him and came back home full of praises about the wonderful monk. We decided to visit him. I imagined him as some, sort, some kind of soothsayer who could help us make crucial decisions about our future life. The next morning we had to take two buses on our way to Petrovac na Mlavi, and then instead of waiting for the rare bus to Vitovnica, we decided to walk the final distance of about seven kilometers of rolling hills on foot. When we passed through the small village at the end of our trip, an amazing sight opened up before our eyes. There was a white monastery on a hill next to a high rock, from which, a little lower, a spring burst, turning into a stream that flowed through a beautiful grove and then along the entire village we had just left behind. When we climbed the hill and entered the monastery, we approached the only person there, a short monk, with white beard and a white smile, who was standing in front of the church and watching us. He was waiting for us. One of us asked where we could find Father Thaddeus, but I could already sense we were talking to him. When we asked him if we could have a talk with him, he suggested we sit a little farther at a wooden table under a black cherry tree on a small plateau overlooking the Vitovnica Valley. He meekly and patiently listened while we told him in a few sentences about our perplexity and internal conflicts. Then a rarely interrupted monologue of about an hour and a half followed. He talked quietly but clearly, mostly looking down, only occasionally looking up at us and showing his grace-filled eyes. My brother and I listened to him carefully, at times laughing, at times letting a tear roll down our cheeks. During the conversation, it felt as if someone from above was removing a dark veil over our eyes, over our prodigal souls. Father Thaddeus just told us little stories from the lives of other people, which was to start like, there's a man here in Kragujevac who or, I knew a woman once, but they were all, we firmly knew, directed at us and they hit us straight into our hearts. For the first time in our lives, God's will was revealed to us in this way, and that was an indescribable experience. After the end of our conversation, when I felt like embracing the entire world, the elder offered us to stay in the monastery overnight and attend the liturgy the next morning. Impatient to pass the grace on to our mother, however, we received his blessing, wished him goodbye, ran down the hill and took a bus back home to Novi Sad. 
Father Thaddeus's main message to us was not to go to a monastery because of two reasons. The first one was that we didn't have our parents' blessing. Our father had died when we were only 10 years old. The second one was the rapid decline of Serbian monastic life with very little true spiritual struggle, struggle left in the monasteries. Until the end of the 20th century, as he told us through an allegory, it would be easier to find a spiritual person in, in the world than in a monastery. He advised us, therefore, to be monks in the world. He also told us about the danger of Eastern teachings and religions towards which, which uh, he felt we were inclined. He said that the ultimate goal of Orthodox Christianity was not miracles or enlightenment, but achieving inner peace through prayer and humbleness. After this first meeting, a hitherto inexperienced euphoria could not leave me for seven days. Everything in life seemed so simple and comprehensible. Unfortunately, this event did not permanently direct me toward the life in the church according to God's commandments, but this is another story. My second and last meeting with Elder Thaddeus took place a few weeks later at the end of the year 1990. He was sick, he wasn't feeling well, and he almost turned us away when we came. Since it was cold and damp outside, we talked in his model, modestly furnished bedroom. He wasn't as cheerful as the first time. He even lightly admonished us. But this second conversation, conversation was just as beneficial. Since the inter-ethnic tension was on the rise in the country, I remember asking him, among other things, about the fate of our nation. He told me that if the Croats don't cease persecuting and mistreating Serbs, they will one day dearly pay for it. The next time I came to Vitovnica was not until after Elder Thaddeus's report, repose, which occurred in 2003, and I only prayed on his grave with my family and lighted a few candles in the church. The monk I, told, I talked to in the church had not even met him. In the next few months after those two visits, I felt reluctant to bother him again with my insignificant problems. When the war broke out the next year, my brother and I returned to the United States to complete our studies. Upon coming back to Serbia, I heard he was staying in a private house 40 kilometers from Novi Sad. I was told he was very feeble and he only talked to the clergy. It wasn't until much later that I found out his stay in that house was connected to maltreatment by the ecclesiastical authority caused by jealousy. The elder accepted the new circumstance, circumstance gracefully and self-effacingly. I don't know if there are still such elders in Serbia or in the world for that matter, but I am only one among many who have testified that Father Thaddeus was, was a true bearer of the Holy Spirit. With his loving advice and prayer, he has helped thousands of visitors. For his unreserved devotion to the Lord and his tireless commitment, commitment to his fellow neighbor, he has received many gifts from God, among them clairvoyance and a grace-filled soul. So we who have met him and talked to him, as well as those who have felt his holiness after being told or reading about him, know that we have a powerful intercessor in heaven. In the final decade of Elder Thaddeus's life, and especially after his holy repose in 2003, a lot of books about his life and teaching came out. The most famous one is called Peace and Joy in the Holy Spirit, which corresponds to the peace he described as the main aim of every Orthodox Christian, and the joy in the Holy Spirit he felt and tried to convey to all who visited him. Years later, in graduate school, while doing research on Mikhail Bakhtin, a 20th century philosopher, I came over a term that reminded me of this ultimate Christian aspiration. When philosophizing and religious professions were still not violent, violently sanctioned in the new Soviet state, Bakhtin and his friends organized philosophical nights, the aim of which was Quote, to rethink all the categories of modern thought in terms of the Russian Orthodox tradition, end of quote. 
In his paper from that period, Problem of Grounded Peace, Problema Abasnovanova Pakoya, in which he outlines what he considered to be the proper task of the philosophy of religion, Bakhtin analyzes the position of the tax collector from the gospel parable as one who finds justification not in himself, like the Pharisee, but in an, in, quote, incarnated third person, end of quote, and posits well-grounded peace as that which is reached when one abandon, abandons self-assurance and passes through period of restlessness and penitence to arrive to a condition of trust in God. And I quote, where for the moral person there are two persons, for the religious consciousness there is a third, the possible person who gives the appraisal. Let us imagine a tax collector who is righteous with regards to religion. Were he to make it imminent the appraisal of himself as a righteous man, he would right away not be righteous. Thus, he could be appraised as righteous only by a third incarnate person. Meanwhile, the Pharisee had absorbed into himself this third consciousness, whereas the tax collector dislodged the possible myth concerning his person through the third person. In the same way, a child saying, little hand, ruchka, obviously receives the appraisal of his merits from his mother. He does not possess an independent self-consciousness of his own merits. In the same way, the appraisal of what I am worth come from without, from the government registry or through custom. I am accorded a certain place at the table. When this hardens into dogma, the mythology of natural right results. In the same way, I gain an appraisal of myself in being a groom or in my soul being a bride, that is, in the love of another." The end of quote. Um, the second important point from this lecture is connected to the principal term in Bakhtin's moral philosophy, event, sabitie. The term be being, bitie, is too abstract. It is removed from our everyday experience, whereas the term event reflects our involvement in the concrete situation and it assumes responsibility for our actions. It is also significant that the prefix so in Russian denotes common participation with another being, as in satrudnik, sabiasetnik, and therefore includes the necessity of collaboration or love for the fellow human being. Another quote from Bakhtin. The form in which the religious consciousness lives in an event, this is the first step in the scheme of religious consciousness. But the duplicity of the concept of event is concluded when, for instance, a historical event is compared to a personal and intimate one. In the intimate event, the main thing is my participation. And so a religious event clearly belongs to this category of participation. I exist in being as in an event. I participate in the only existing point at which something is accomplished. accomplished. The religious impermeability is not at all physical. The fact that I cannot be effaced, that my one and only place within being cannot be destroyed, analogously to physical impermeability. Dogmatic metaphysics transform it, transforms it into a substantial one, although it is only a participation on the level of event. And you see the consciousness is what conscious is. That is not a moral obligation, but that of uniqueness. No one in the whole world can accomplish that which I must accomplish. So, um, the word prichastness, uh, participation, is not used accidentally here. It points to prichastie, communion, and highlights the difference between consuming the body and blood of our Savior and just a general belief without participation in the life of the church centered around the Holy Eucharist. 
Finally, in the same short lecture, Bakhtin introduces the con concept of repentance as a result of placing the appraiser of our soul outside of us and accepting its role as the path to grounded peace. And this is the last quote. The true existence of the spirit begins only when repentance begins. That is the principal lack of correspondence. All that can be of value. All exists outside of me and I am only a negative instance. Only the receptacle of evil. To grope and touch, finally, one's being as it truly is. To reach, finally, the true reality of one's own person. To cast aside all mythologies about it. I'm endlessly bad, but someone needs me to be good. Repenting, I establish precisely that one in whom I establish my sinful, sinfulness. This is what grounded peace is. The peace which does not imagine things. Peace can be either that of being pleased with oneself or that of trust. trust. What must liberate me from the peace of being pleased with myself that is, from the peace of an aesthetic mythology is restlessness which, through repentance, will become trust. So, for Bakhtin, well-grounded peace is reached by the abandonment of self-reliance, by penitence, and by the consequent trust in God. Bakhtin rejects monologism inherent in the split between the world of endless theoretical possibility and the world of concrete historical reality through a dialogic relationship with the other and the ideal image of the other is for him the embodied grace bestowing other Christ. In Christ he finds the highest of all his voices available to the subject through God's energies, concrete manifestation of abstract ideas. We see the divine in other people and a response-oriented dialogue with them. For Bhakti, the body is just as sacred as the soul and the spirit is the loophole that circumvents death in Russian, Oglyatka, um, and enables the unfinalizability of the soul. The interpermeation of the human and divine natures in man is what in essence represents dialogism. The open-ended dialogue with the other and the other with capital O, the divine principle enables theosis, abajenia, and the denial of spirit leads to an infinite monoglossia and the captivity of human spirit. Elder Thaddeus, who relies solely on his own spiritual experience and the teaching of Christ and the Holy Fathers of the Church, similarly talks about peace. He assigns it only to the grace-bestowing grace bestowing God who can pass it on to us if we are prepared for it by prayer, a yearning desire, and repentance. I quote him. We are here on earth as under epithemia. We have to prepare to learn about heavenly life to acquire the divine peace. No one here can give us that peace. God is the only one giving peace to all creation, including us, if we seek him and if we want him in our hearts, if we want to unite with him. He wants our spirit to be united with him, with our God. Our desire and our will to be united with his divine will, divine desire our entire being to be united with him to feel the joy of life." The end of quote. So he has found this all-conquering tranquility, the inner peace in Christ and through Christ by letting go and accepting his love. Further on in a sermon he says, quote, "'Peace and joy to all from God, for peace and joy is the greatest treasure of this and the other world. We all yearn for it. We can have here on earth many things, everything we want, but if we don't have inner peace, there is no use from it. And peace comes from the source of peace, from the Lord. The Lord, when he addressed his disciples, the first thing he said to them was, peace to you. So I wish to you all peace and joy from the Lord. And another quote. A peaceful person considers everyone higher than him, and not only person, but creation too. 
says Elder Thaddeus, reflecting Bakhtin's prerequisite for a true repentance. Quote, Repentance means a complete turn toward, towards the absolute good with our heart, feelings, thoughts, and our entire being to unite in inseparable love with our parent, our creator. The end of quote. A lot more is said through life than through words, says Elder Thaddeus, giving a living example, an event in Bakhtinian terms for us to follow. And the last quote. When we see a peaceful and humble soul which cannot get angry, angry, which doesn't know how to have evil thoughts, does not chastise, judge, which doesn't get angry even when we offend it, then this person throughout our life remains as a living example. And then we want to be like that because we notice that such a person in its humble and peaceful heart has overcome evil with God's help and that evil, that evil cannot influence it anymore. Outside this soul is surrounded by unrest, but it cannot touch the interior of its soul. It does not disturb its peace. The end of quote. If this peace were caused by some haphazard circumstance, it would not be grounded, but with its origin in the source of life, it has a rock solid foundation. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly, from, says the Lord in uh, the Gospel of John 10.10. 10. So influenced by German idealism and Neo-Kantianism, Bakhtin mixed theological and philosophical term terminology uh, the beginning of, at the beginning of his intellectual career. After persecution, imprisonment and exile, the Christian motifs are increasingly, increasingly disguised in his writing, but the meaning, the meaning of his thought remains essentially Christian. As Graham Pesci puts it, by demonstrating that, this is quote, by demonstrating that sec secular forms are transformations of the founding forms of Christian belief, Bakhtin connects the traditional moral beliefs with more modern ideas in ethics and epistemology. In this day and age of apostasy and the reign of mammon, when evil seems to be very powerful and overwhelming, one has to use every possible way and approach to set the souls gone astray on the right path, the way, the truth, and the life. Sometimes we can relate to the prodigal souls in an unexpected way through something they have accepted as inspiring and instructive. In the time of political and economic turmoil, war and NATO bombing, Elder Thaddeus has given a lot of hope to people of Serbia and through the testimonies of his life and work to the Orthodox all over the globe. Thanks to beacons like him, we're not looking forward to delight and entertainment, but to the struggle, suffering, and the resurrection of the dead. Thank you very much, Sutazar. Do we have any questions? If there are no questions, I just want to uh, say something that we talked about earlier uh, related to Elder Thaddeus and hope, how he has given hope to people. And uh, I heard it actually from two people, the fact that he had a nervous breakdown at one point because he was the elder he was a, uh, the abbot of a few monasteries. And he, he, it was so hard for him to uh, look at, I mean, first of all, the responsibility was really hard for him to bear. And then the second thing is, it was really hard for him to see uh, the brethren fighting between themselves. So he, this really affected him so much that he actually had a nervous breakdown. And, 
And then, and then he also had two heart attacks when he, was, when he was a little bit older. But then he finally decided to give everything, all his troubles and worries, to God and his Holy Mother. And he succeeded in doing this. And he actually had a vision in his sleep where he said, this is what you have to do. This is how you have to relax, to give away all the troubles to, uh, to those who can handle it. And this is our Lord and his Holy Mother. So this, if, if, if a holy person like this has gone through all this and had nervous breakdown because of um, uh, feeling that he cannot accomplish everything that has been given to him and the, to accepting the, the responsibility, this gives us hope uh, that we can actually, that we have to, that we can handle the situation that we are in, which, is, which are probably not as big, but sometimes they feel huge. Thank you.